Good afternoon, everyone. This is Roy Massaros with SWS. Today, we're going to be talking about the history of SWS, how it got started, and we're going to be interviewing Kathy Ewell. I want to begin with an introduction regarding SWS. It is a it is the Society of Wetland Scientists, an international professional nonprofit organization devoted to wetlands. Its mission is to promote best management practices in wetland research, education, conservation, preservation, restoration, and management. The membership is open to anyone with an interest in wetlands, and there are now more than 3,000 members worldwide. SWS has 16 regional chapters around the world with nine sections that organize symposia and workshops for the SWS annual meetings. And they include biochemistry, education, global change ecology, peatlands, public policy and regulation, Ramsar, wetland restoration, wildlife, and women in wetlands. SWS was founded in March of 1980 by Richard McCumber, a biologist with the United States Army Corps of Engineers, Board of Rivers and Harbors. The first issue of Wetlands, the site of Premier's International Journal, now published by Springer, first appeared in 1981 as proceedings for the annual meeting. The SWS Bolton dealt with primarily with society business for many years, but eventually was developed into a quarterly journal called Wetland Science and Practice. So today we're going to look into the history of SWS, how it got started. We're interviewing Kathy Ewell, and we're doing this as a wetland interview, part of the SWS webinar committee. And this is to share information, inspire others to participate in SWS, generate interest, et cetera. So I'd like to introduce Kathy Ewell. She was a professor at Emerita University of Florida. She's a systems ecology. She was a systems ecologist specializing in wetland ecology. She was born and raised in Glens Falls, New York and received the AB degree from Cornell University in zoology and the PhD from the University of Florida in zoology. She spent more than 20 years as a faculty member at the School of Forest Resources and Conservation at the University of Florida, where her research included projects on the ecology and management of pond cypress swamps and pine plantations. During the last 11 years of her career, she was a research ecologist at the USDA Forest Services Institute of the Pacific Islands Forestry in Honolulu, Hawaii. There she focused on the ecology and management of mangrove forests and freshwater forests and wetlands in the US affiliated Pacific Islands. Kathy served the Society of Wetland Scientists as vice president, president and past president from 2003 to 2006. In 2013, she was named a fellow of the Society of Wilton Scientists. In 2002, Kathy received the Forest Service Chiefs Award for Multicultural Organization. In 2022, she received the University of Florida's Stephen C. O'Connell Distinguished Service Award, which is given to University of Florida alumni for exceptional public service to the state of Florida or the nation at large. So welcome, Kathy, and hopefully I captured your background adequately. And we had created some questions to dive into how SWS got started. So we'll begin now with the interview question and answer. And the first question that I have, Kathy, if you're ready, are you ready? I'm ready. Excellent. I'd like to know what was the impetus for starting SWS? I suppose it was back in 1980. SWS, the, the idea of, of SWS uh, actually came up um, probably in the, the um, mid-1970s when the Clean Water Act was uh, passed in 1972. The Corps of Engineers and the uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency were responsible for developing policies and regulations. And so uh, Richard McComber uh, was giving a lot of short courses, workshops, and so forth to get people up to speed on what we knew about wetlands, which was not a great deal at that time. Um, you know, wetlands, the word wetlands was, was very com uncommon um, before the, the, uh, the 70s even. So um, as he was giving these, these short courses, he would say to, the, the, uh, to his clients were mostly consultants and, and people who worked with wetlands, and, uh, and they agreed that they needed some format for exchanging ideas about wetland science. And, uh, and so uh, some of them got together and, um, 
uh, put a rough draft together and then uh, started the society in 1980. Okay, and a question that I have is at some point in policy making state and federal, there was this, I'll call it a major shift, paradigm shift between what was historically thought of about wetlands and what was then a change in policy to preserve wetlands. And I would say that wetland scientists always knew the value of wetlands, but state and federal regulations did not. So during the time that SWS was formed back in the mid seventies, where was that federal regulations to preserve wetlands? Was that, had that come to fruition yet? And did that question make sense? Well, it, it um, uh, people really didn't know how to think about wetlands. I think uh, perhaps uh, E.P. Odom's um, analysis, financial analysis of the value of salt marshes in Georgia caught everybody's attention. And so, so we began looking at other kinds of wetlands and thinking, well, these are, have been mostly considered as just wastelands. And right. when, when in fact, uh, the, um, they were valuable for, um, uh, for containing uh, pollutants, for regulating floods, uh, for uh, serving as, as nursery areas for fish and, and, uh, and other wildlife. And these were things that we sensed uh, but really didn't have a lot of good data for. And so we were trying to pull together uh, a concept of, of how to get this across. And, and we did this gradually, I think, during the next several years as the society um, began to form and, and, and people, um, faculty members started teaching courses in wetland ecology, uh, but it was a long time coming. Right, right. And I'd like to comment just from my own perspective, because I'm a professional wetland scientist. I worked for the Army Corps of Engineers for 18 years. This interview is not about me, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about what uh, was the change in policy with state and federal laws. There has been classes in wetlands. I teach right now this semester, I'm teaching a course at NYU called Wetland Design for Water Quality Improvement. I also teach a class at Stevens Institute called Wetland Hydrology. I like the name that NYU has because wetlands are nature's way to purify for water, water quality. So the idea of that class at NYU for wetland design for water quality improvement is really what one of the values, functions and values are for wetlands. And that paradigm that I talked about, paradigm shift, where there was an appreciation for wetlands by the general public and not just wetland scientists and how that led to change in policy. My, my next question was, it, how easy or what, what were the challenges? Was it easy to get the SWS off the ground and starting that, um, that program, the society? Well, there was certainly a lot of goodwill involved and, and people who were willing to work very hard to do this. Um, the uh, Richard McComber felt that, uh, that it was appropriate for the president of a, uh, of a scientific society to have a PhD and he didn't. And so the first president actually did have a PhD. He was one of, one of his contractors at the University of, of um, uh, North Carolina, and, uh, uh, James Parnell. And um, so we had uh, mostly at that time, I think, government employees, uh, consultants, and very few academics um, contributing to this effort. And, and so as it developed, more and more academic um, people, teachers, uh, research scientists uh, joined them. And so one of the unique features of the society, I think, is this mix of, of policy people, scientists, uh, regulators, uh, consultants, all meeting together and being interested in what each other is doing and realizing that we all have to work together uh, in order to, to, um, to do a good job. And so that's, I, I think the, it got started with mostly government people, and then folding the academics into the um, into this uh, uh, the plan that they had laid out was was a little bit difficult because these people have very different ways of valuing uh, themselves and, and their messages. Okay, what were some of the obstacles that you can comment on that need to be overcome and discuss any issues that may have hindered the creationist SWS? So. It'd be interesting to have some perspective on 
challenges and obstacles, things of that sort? Well, there were there were things that I don't think anybody could have foreseen. For instance, I I was made aware of the society I think in about 1982, and Ronnie Best, who was a uh, a colleague at the University of Florida, uh, said that I I really should belong, and he gave me the forms, and he said he'd be glad to to um, sponsor me, and I thought sponsor me, <laughs> why should I be sponsored to join a society? And I I was actually miffed that I had to prove myself. As a, as a wetland scientist before I could be allowed to join. And so it was a, probably another year or so before I finally sent in my curriculum VD and, and, uh, and they, they, they uh, put me on the rolls and joined me up. And it was years before I realized that that, that uh, requirement was a credential for the consultants and for many of the government people, consultants especially, because they could say to their clients, I am a good enough wetland ecologist uh, that I was accepted for membership into the Society of Wetland Scientists. And so you can see that we, we would think very differently and, and we just didn't realize that, that that was the issue. So today in order to become, you can, anybody can be a member of SWS, Society of Wetland Scientists, but in order to become a professional wetland scientist, PWS, you have to have certain education, certain project work, et cetera. And I know from my own experience working at the Army Corps of Engineers that there are certain projects today that if they're in wetland mitigation, wetland restoration projects, you would need a PWS on the project in order for the project to move forward in, in construction. So I think that is a little bit about what you're talking about. Although SWS can be made up of consultants, academics, and people from the government and the general public at large with an interest in wetlands, but in order to have your PWS, that's part of that credential qualification that you went through. Is, is that correct? What I'm what yes, I'm yes, that's right. Uh, and so, uh, as time went along, the first three or four years, um, Richard McConville himself suggested that we needed some kind of certification process uh, for this very reason. And uh, and so that part of the society was very much for it. Uh, again, the academics um, just didn't see that as as being a big deal. And um, Kurt Richardson, when he was um, president in um, uh, 1987, he pushed for that. And, uh, and then a couple of years later, when Mark Brinson was president, he actually, he had a, a committee, I think it was um, Charlie Newling and Mary Landon and Harold Jones, uh, probably others too. They got together and sort of roughed out uh, a plan of, of how to do that. And Mark was afraid that that the um, uh, that it wouldn't pass. You know, it sounded good, but he didn't think it was convincing to the academics. And so he worked on it for the next year with the committee, and they set it up so they had everything outlined, exactly what the forms would be, what the requirements would be, um, what the fees would be, you know, so that when Ronnie Best was president then it came up and it passed. And so that was the certif certification process that led to PWS. And, uh, and so the two, uh, the, um, the certification remained within SWS uh, for several years, but it, was, it really required a lot of um, administrative time. And so finally, under Frank Day's presidency, uh, he, um, they separated the two societies, PCP and, and SWS, and signed a, a, a memorandum of agreement. And so the two societies have, have gone along in parallel, usually meeting together, um, but doing business separately. And that has worked out beautifully. Okay, and you've mentioned a litany of individuals, but I just wanted to ask, it makes me want to ask the question, who are the founding members of the SWS? Um, and that, not just one person, but those folks that were, getting this effort off the ground in 1980 after it was actually formed. Can you talk a little bit about the founding members and what you know about those founding members, who they were, their names, where they were, academics, et cetera, government, et cetera? The, um, of course, Richard McComber and, and James Parnell was, uh, was the first president. Uh, uh, Paul Knutson, who I think was a, um, I, I don't know what position he had. I think he was a consultant, I'm not sure. Um, William Adams. Uh, Frank Yelverton, these were all people who, who played a big role early on. Uh, I'll mention 
specifically Dave Dumont, who uh, he was the, um, uh, he took on the secretary general position. He had a cardboard box, a, a shoe box with an index card for every member. And so, and so as the society grew, he needed more and more shoe boxes. And, uh, and it, it was a tremendous amount of work. Uh, his wife was very, very helpful. They devoted basically two rooms in their house uh, to serve essentially as the business office for SWS. And um, eventually when, when computers came in, uh, his wife um, helped him uh, help get the files onto, onto computers. And, uh, and she, she was given an honorary membership in, in SWS for her, uh, for her efforts. And, uh, and then eventually it was clear uh, that, we, that we needed um, uh, dedicated um, professional help in administering the society. And so eventually uh, we started with a, a, um, with a small uh, agreement with Alan Press, who, who, was, uh, who would then be publishing the, uh, the journal. And uh, that wasn't quite enough. And so we, we hired a, a company called Birkin Associates and then they have been replaced. And, and so that, that's how we have, have done it since then. That is a very interesting perspective. I didn't want to interrupt your speaking, but early days shoe boxes versus today computers, <clears throat> tablets, and mobile devices. Since these interviews are intended to inspire some of the um, younger uh, folks that are still in academics studying their bachelor's degree, I think it's interesting perspective and to comment on how things have changed because of technology and that or what used to be index cards and shoe boxes can now be administered through a tablet or cell phone and how much easier life is because of the technology that we have. That's some interesting perspective. So regarding the history of SWS, I'd be interested to know, and our listeners would be interested to know about some early successes. Then of course, the corollary of that would be something that might've been failures or um, major obstacles. So let's start with some early successes with SWS when, when this effort was launched in 1980. Can you talk a little bit about efforts that were successful other than the fact that this was bringing academics and government and consultants together? What, were, what might have been some of the early successes for SWS once it formed? Well, it, it, uh, one of the early successes was it, it gained in membership um, at a rapid, a very rapid pace. There are, it obviously appealed to a lot of people and, and, and was filling a need. One of the, um, uh, one of the problems uh, that arose, um, see, I'm having trouble pulling out. Uh, the, the uh, I forget the exact issue, but uh, I think it was when the um, uh, Clean Water Act uh, was being revisited, okay. and, there was, and there was consideration that uh, that perhaps um, it might be, um, you know, something else might come and, and take its place. Um, Mark Brinson was uh, was president, and uh, a number of people were getting in touch with him, saying, um, "What can we do? Uh, what can be done about this?" And so Mark actually uh, joined a um, a working group uh, with uh, government people and a bunch of people to try to, to um, outline uh, why the Clean Water Act was important and why wetlands should be protected. Uh, and there was, a, uh, uh, there was a, a, a substantial part of the society at that time who felt that that was, um, that was really not our role. And uh, they felt as though we should be um, putting the science out, um, getting the science, putting the science out, uh, and let the, the reader then take it from there. And uh, there was a pretty strong um, uh, difference between these two groups. Um, but obviously, uh, what Mark did, of course, was, was say that, that he, he was just, his contribution was, was strictly factual, uh, strictly science. It wasn't a matter of lobbying uh, or anything like that. And, uh, and, so, and so that did, uh, that was a major success. The, uh, we started at that point uh, with a, we formed committees, and I think we had started doing a little bit before that too, to, to put together policy papers uh, or you know, white papers uh, on some controversial on controversial topics. 
and uh, so, uh, Sandy Doyle Ahern was one of the um, people who really was did the omens work in those in those early years, and um, uh, and, and now uh, they still do this. There's no specific committee, but but usually the executive board uh, forms a group uh, to uh, address these issues as as they came up. And so I think that was one of the big successes was was being able. Uh, to speak out professionally and 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 have uh, have a say in in what was happening on the on the national scale. So that piece you just discussed was it sounded like some successes and hurdles or obstacles. So it sounded like you addressed both of those issues, successes and obstacles. Am I correct in understanding yes. what you talked yes. about? And and I should say that even today, I would say uh, I think. Um, Gillian Davies, when she was um, uh, president, she did a, they did a, um, a survey and they found that uh, roughly 9% of the membership uh, does not feel that we should be uh, weighing in on these matters, that, that we should just be standing aside, presenting the information and letting it, it speak for itself. But the, the um, uh, 88% of the society did, um, did agree with that approach. And I should also say that, that what we have done, we're no longer really uh, in this fight by ourselves. We have, uh, we have allied with a number of other societies to make consortia to, to speak as a large group of scientists, a much larger group of scientists uh, across a broader realm of, of capabilities uh, than just the uh, just SWS. I'd like to follow up on that thread. So the thread I wanted to follow up on, Kathy, was to see if you could shed some light on the other organizations that SWS collaborates with in some of these annual meetings that are now scheduled. Can you talk a little bit about what other groups that we, we SWS, is now teaming with and coordinating with? Well, there, there are a number of societies uh, that are that function much as SWS does. We look specifically at wetlands. There's the the Coastal uh, Environmental uh, Research Federation. Uh, they look more at, at coastal, at coastal and estuary uh, research federation. They look at more coastal sorts of things. Um, but perhaps the most important uh, one is INTACOL, which is the uh, International Society of Ecology, which, um, which encompasses the whole range of, of ecological societies. And in, uh, in 1980, about the time that SWS was forming, there was a working group in Intercol who wanted to form a section on wetlands. Uh, Jean Turner at Louisiana State University uh, was one of those people. And uh, they put together a meeting in India that brought together ecologists, wetland ecologists from all over the world. And every four years uh, since then, there has been an Intercol meeting that includes SW, that, uh, well, sometimes it, it formally includes SWS, not necessarily, um, uh, but a lot of SWS members um, uh, participate. There's never been a formal uh, agreement between the two societies, but it's, it has enabled SWS scientists uh, to meet um, scientists from all around the world to see what kinds of problems they have, how they address them. And of course, there are lots of similarities Lots of different ways of skinning the cat. It's it's really been a, a a tremendous help. Okay, so that that makes me want to ask about the um, national component versus the international component. I think you and I ahead of time talked about wanting to discuss a little bit about the international component. Can you speak about that international versus national component? You kind of touched on that a little bit when you talk about meetings that are. Um, international at this point. So the question I'm asking is the international component versus the national component. Okay, the, the um, of course SWS, uh, ever since it was formed, every single president has been, uh, has pushed for more of, of, of an international component. And from the very beginning, we had Canadians who were members and our, our um, second president was Walter Glushenko, who was a, a, a Canadian. Uh, the, the, um, the interesting thing about SWS is that when you join, you are immediately a part of a chapter. So the, the United States is divided into um, geographic areas. Uh, 
so that whoever you are and wherever you are, you belong to a chapter and you can meet in that chapter with uh, government scientists, consultants, whatever, who are in that particular area, in addition to having these associations in the national unit. Now with the international uh, chapters, uh, they began forming in about 2000 and uh, Australia, um, which is now the uh, part of the Oceania uh, chapter, they were the first ones and some have failed, some have done quite well. And the, the problem there is that it's, we're talking about the smaller number of, of people spread over an area, a large area, and uh, very often uh, there are different uh, languages within that area. So we do have, for instance, all of Africa and all of Latin America as two components of what we call the international chapter. There just aren't enough people in any individual country or enough resources to bring these people together. And so the, the um, uh, things like the intercall meetings are one way of, of, of being able to, to keep these people involved. And SWS has been very good at um, they have set up uh, Spanish um, webinars, um, other kinds of, of, of meetings uh, within these areas. But it's, uh, I think we've all realized it's extremely important, um, but it's, it's not easy. And especially these days with uh, worrying about climate change, um, worrying about how much, we're, how much carbon we're spending on flying from one place to another, it's, it's very, very hard for us all to get together. So we're finding um, unusual and imaginative ways of, 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 of maintaining contacts. And certainly things like, like this interview, like webinars uh, have been an extremely important part. Okay, we, we're about 30 minutes into the interview and we like to keep it about 30 to 40 minutes. We have time for a few more questions and one of the things that I wanted to ask about was SWS getting traction with lawmakers in Washington, but because the founding father of SWS was with the United States Army Corps of Engineers, we've talked about Brinson as well with, was with the Army Corps. So can you talk a little bit about what got how did SWS got traction in Washington with lawmakers and was it SWS and Army Corps people? I mean, how did, how did that happen with Army Corps folks? And because they're a federal agency, did that help getting traction in Washington? Well, of course, with the Clean Water Act, it was the Army Corps and Environmental Protection Agency that were mandated to do what needed to be done um, to get the wetlands message uh, put together and made available to the whole country. And so that I think was the, the biggest, um, uh, the biggest push, um, but other than that, uh, I mean, because we have these these alliances with other uh, societies, um, I I don't know that SWS by itself has any uh, particular traction um, that, okay. that that is pertinent. Okay, and a couple other thoughts that I have as we contemplate closing. The interview, um, thoughts, motive, and interest for people to get involved with SWS. So I'd like to get your input on that as well. But I also want the listeners to be aware that you and I are both volunteers. I'm with the webinar committee. That's what this effort with the wetland interviews is all about. And we have passion for wetlands. I want to emphasize that passion for wetlands. And that's why we volunteer our time in this noble effort to advocate preservation, research, protection for wetlands, et cetera. So that in itself is it motivating interest to people to be involved because of people's passion with wetlands. What's your thought concerning motivated interest for people to get involved with the SWS? Um, weigh in on that. Well, the, the, um, one of the things that SWS did right from the very beginning, and I didn't realize this, you know, when I was getting in a snit about um, having to prove myself, I thought, well, my students would never be able to join. Well, right from the very beginning, uh, they had, of course, a special category for students. And uh, when we first started giving awards, the first awards went to students for the best paper and so forth. And, um, and so making the society uh, attractive to students has really been a, a very, very good way of, of keeping the inflow 
uh, of, of members as these students um, graduate and, and get on into their careers. It's, it's, um, they're very welcome. They're, there are lots of ways that they're helped to, uh, to get to meetings. Uh, and so it's, it's just, it's almost automatic. And I think that works, uh, that works very well. And we have had uh, quite a bit of, of effort. Frank Day uh, really got a, a, um, a great start on, on increasing, trying to increase the uh, diversity of, of students coming into the, into the society. And once you're in there, uh, frankly, having these international connections and also the connections within your own region between government um, consultants, um, uh, government consultants and academics, uh, it, it's, it, it just helps you um, be in touch with, with a whole variety of people who, who have interest in wetlands and, and have some say about wetlands. Very good. And um, we've kind of talked about this throughout this interview, but how does being a member of SWS help with careers in wetland science? Your entire career is with wetland science. And I've already talked, we've already talked about PWS as being a requirement for certain project work today, but maybe I can get your response on how does being a member of SWS help with careers in wetland science? Well, um, we, get to, we get to know each other. One of the things uh, I found as a member of SWS as opposed to Ecological Society is that when, um, when I'm at a board meeting, then I have to I have to get to know who these other people are who I would never see in a, in a, a paper session, perhaps. Um, you, you, you form these relationships um, with people who uh, provide perspectives that you just might not otherwise have. And, uh, and, and that's just such a constant thread throughout SWS. I, I think it's really the, one of the things that, that helps us uh, not get too focused on what we think is most important without realizing uh, the societal um, uh, impacts. That's a very good point. So we're at time right now. So I wanted to thank you for it's a Saturday afternoon, uh, first weekend in April. I wanted to thank, thank you very much for your time to come on and um, do this interview because it is a great benefit to our society and hopefully inspiring others and sharing your history with SWS, it was valuable to me doing this interview and I hope others who listen to this find it as interesting as I did. Do you have any other thoughts or comments you'd like to make before actually a close? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. I will thank you very much again for your time and um, I'm sure we'll be in touch and seeing each other virtually or meetings, et cetera. So thank you again for your time. Have a good rest of your day. Great, thank you very much, I've enjoyed it.